Thank you for attending our webinar. Our event today will feature presentations by Verdantix and UPS. Verdantix is an independent analyst covering topics including energy, the environment, and sustainability. And most of you, I'm sure, know UPS. They're one of the largest package delivery and logistics firms in the world. The topic will be big energy data and using innovative data-driven technologies to manage energy usage in UPS's 1,800 facilities across the country. My name is Eric Becker, and I'll be the moderator for the session today. And joining me is Susan Clark with Verdantix. Susan leads up practice areas including smart grid and IT-enabled services and technologies for Verdantix. And Bill Moyer is here with me as well. Bill's been with UPS for over 27 years and is the energy program manager at UPS. The agenda today will include the following. We're scheduled to uh, be here today for an hour, finishing up by 2 o'clock Eastern. I'll start by offering an introduction to Virginet, and then Susan will join, and she'll be talking, providing Verdan Texas insights into the world of energy management and how this, top, how this topic is becoming much more strategic for large enterprises and how it's also at the same time becoming much more reliant on data and data analytics. And then Bill will be joining us. He will be talking about how UPS is managing energy usage in 1,800 facilities across the United States, both the challenges they faced and the lessons they learned. At the end, we'll be doing a Q&A. So as we go through the presentation, I encourage you to go ahead and submit your questions through the online site. And at the end of it, we'll take as many questions as time allows. Data is the foundation of all analytics. So this is obviously recognized by Verdantix and is the basis for the quote that you see here before you. But also other players in the space are increasingly recognizing this, both large energy users and other technology firms in the space. This is the problem that Urgenet is focused on. So our mission is to provide our customers with the best energy data possible. So one of the things that's innovative about our business is we're one of the only players out there that's focused solely on the data problem. We don't offer utility bill pay services. We don't provide software or analytic capability. And we don't provide any form of energy management related services. We're focused solely on the idea of providing our customers the best energy data possible. And we do this through a technology platform. We do this through a technology platform that integrates with various energy related data sources. A primary source of energy data that we're aggregating is information that comes directly from utility billing systems. So we've integrated now with over 800 different utility billing systems, both to gather billing data, but also increasingly providing for our customers advanced metering data and now weather data. We've integrated with 500 weather stations and are also bringing weather data into our platform. We bring this data into our platform and then we run it through a series of computerized audits, over 150 in fact, to ensure that the data we're bringing in is both complete and accurate. And then importantly, in our platform, all this information is normalized. Since the data comes from so many different disparate sources, it's very important for our customers to get a simple, integrated, normalized data feed to make that information readily consumable. And finally, we deliver this information to our customers, either directly into industry standard applications they may have, or through custom connectors that we build into other proprietary applications that our customers want to use the data in. By doing this all as an automated technology platform, it has several benefits for our customers. The data we're providing gets to them much faster. The data is more accurate and richer. And the data is provided in a way that's much more cost effective for them. We provide our data service as four different products. The first is Utility Connect. Utility Connect provides our customers with detailed utility invoice data. We also offer Meter Connect, which is day behind interval and smart meter data that our customers can take advantage of. Weather Connect provides our customers weather data and a facility-based weather sensitivity index. And finally, Alert Connect, which notifies our customers of billing or usage anomalies that we detect in the process of aggregating their energy data. That's a brief summary of the Urgent offering. And now I'd like to hand it over to Susan Clark with Verdantix. Great, thank you. 
So we often hear that the world is becoming more data-centric as the result of the automation of previously manual processes and the digitalization trends across different industries. It seems that both corporate and government bodies are needing to manage larger data volumes at speeds moving towards real time. To compete effectively in this market, it is becoming more necessary for firms to gather data and analyze the data so they can make the decisions fast. The pace of change in data is being enabled by the convergence of three major trends. Firstly, there have been technology improvements and the uptake of new data collection devices. Secondly, the decline in the cost of data management. And thirdly, there has been the uptake of open communication protocols, which allow different types of devices and systems to communicate. So big data has become a big buzz phrase across IT and businesses to describe the trend of moving towards bigger data sets. There is a wide array of opinions on what big data means, but it is best captured as data that is high volume, high velocity, and high variety. So the trend of big data is one we are also seeing within energy management. As I'm sure we are all aware, data sets are not, large data sets are not entirely new to the world. For example, Google and Yahoo have been managing big internet data for over a decade. But what is new is big data sets on energy because of the scaling up of corporate energy management programs and utility deployments of smart meters. There are now over 37 million smart meters deployed in the US. So as energy rises up the corporate agenda, the management of energy is moving from tactical to strategic. And this is having an impact on the organizational requirements of energy data and energy data management. Energy decision makers are looking for a more centralized data management system for their energy and business data partly because they want more granular insight into their energy consumption and generation. But they also want to apply this, um, business intelligence to these energy data sets so they can plan more effectively for energy spend and energy usage. And this is because large corporations are waking up to the impact of energy costs on organizations, such as the impact on profit margins. And the leading firms are acknowledging that the volatility of energy costs can impact the quarterly financial performance of their firms. And let me now share some results from our 2013 Energy Leaders Survey, where we spoke to 250 energy management decision makers at multi-million dollar firms. It was clear by speaking to these 250 energy managers, firms are taking lots of different steps to build out more strategic energy management programs, with the leading firms looking to achieve better competitive financial performance and to mitigate risk. At the top of the list of investment priorities, though, is improving energy data collection and reporting. This reflects the reality that many firms currently rely on insufficient, inaccurate, or dispersed energy data. This creates energy information gaps. Without a consolidated and normalized view into energy consumption patterns and costs across the organization, firms can't identify and benchmark energy efficiency opportunities. So what challenges do firms face in managing energy data? So the first challenge is that data sets on energy are getting bigger. This is the result of both the integration of existing energy data sets combined with the deployment of more energy data collection devices and sensors across the enterprise. 
firms are upping their deployment of metering devices as they are looking to build better data profiles of their firm's energy consumption. And in distributed retail chains or utilities that have deployed smart meters, you can easily reach over 1 million energy endpoints. <coughs> and gathering up larger amounts of energy data from meters and utility bills is often a frustrating and time-consuming process, not to mention the cost elements of trying to obtain energy data across hundreds of facilities. This diagram is a hypothetical example to show the various streams of energy data within a distributed retail firm. This retailer is receiving bills from over 50 different utilities, meter data from 200 retail stores, along with other types of business operational data. Our research has found that real estate and retail firms struggle with accurate multi-site billing and need functionality to consolidate and streamline their utility bill management processes. Due to this complexity, many firms currently rely on manual data entry from utility bills or direct energy meter readings. The second challenge is that energy data is getting global. And that here are some more results from our Global Energy Leaders Survey, where we spoke to 250 energy decision makers. So when we asked these energy decision makers about their firm's approach to energy management, we heard the majority of firms elevate energy management decision making above local managers. Over two-thirds of energy managers said their firm had a global energy management strategy in place with a centralised decision-making structure. What is significant here is that these firms will want to integrate energy data sets from the different sites and countries they operate in to support these global energy management strategies. So, the next challenge is that energy data is getting more varied. Firstly, energy consumption data itself is getting increasingly complex as a result of the coordination of different energy consuming and generating assets such as lights, HVAC, wind turbines and manufacturing equipment that may exist across corporate portfolios. As firms are trying to more strategically manage energy, they may look to also pull in weather data to understand the impact of seasonal shifts and weather events on energy performance. And the key challenge here is that these data types are commonly captured in disconnected data management systems, which create information silos. Thinking about energy data, it is commonly collected by data management systems at the facility or regional level. And business operational data is contained in platforms which have been developed for specific business functions. And this really means that firms often have um, a lack of centralized data which prohibits them from uncovering new patterns and associations with respect to energy across the enterprise. And finally, energy data feeds are getting quicker. And this is really the result of the business and utility deployment of real-time data collection devices. Energy managers commonly believe that real-time data, energy data collection combined with advanced analytics can deliver significant value by enabling better energy decision making. At the same time, firms often lack in-house energy data analysis skills to properly extract insight from these speedy data streams. They may also not have internal resources to act upon real-time data, and this also indicates the organisational challenges that sit along the, challenge, the technology challenges with big energy data. So, it is in particular utilities who are feeling the impact of larger and higher frequency data feeds 
as the result of utility-scale smart meter deployment. There has been a rapid pace of change in terms of the amount of data utilities are collecting, but our research has found that utility systems are often not improving quickly enough. So to bring the points together made in the previous slide, the volume, velocity, and variety of energy data is overwhelming both IT departments and energy leaders. We have separated big energy data challenges into two main buckets, the technical challenges and organizational challenges. As this diagram shows, the scaling up of corporate energy management programs requires technology upgrades across data storage, processing, and business intelligence tools. As businesses move towards managing energy data at the enterprise, centralizing storage and access to data will become essential, as will be being able to aggregate data into a more standardized and comparable format. Secondly, firms must develop the governance and organization-wide coordination of energy data to support their firm's overall business strategy. We have heard that firms often lack this complete or accurate understanding of their data profile and may struggle to analyze energy impacts across business processes and functional boundaries. Clearly lots of challenges with energy data management. And through our interviews with 250 energy leaders, we heard that energy managers, alongside the desire to maintain standard energy operations, have growing demands around energy data analytics. They want better insights into energy use, more controls to better optimize operations, along with better energy procurement. And this is partially being driven by the changing role of the energy manager within large organizations. As energy rises up the corporate agenda and becomes an increasingly strategic issue for businesses, we foresee the, new, the emergence of a new breed of energy manager. This is someone who is comfortable in both the boiler room as well as the boardroom. The role of the energy manager will not just be about energy operations and assuring the maintenance of equipment, but the energy manager will want excellent data sets so they can start having a real impact on company margins and profits. So, in response to all these new data challenges and customer demands, we have seen a new wave of data-driven innovation which are helping corporates to address these challenges and more strategically manage their energy data. These innovations all fall into the broad category of big energy data software. We define big energy data software as software applications designed to handle high volume, high velocity, and high variety energy data across consumption, distribution, transmission and generation through data aggregation and advanced analytics. This often includes the integration of energy related data, including weather data, building asset data, and various forms of business operational data to provide context to the energy data itself. So, our research has found that firms are converging on the big energy data software market from different positions. This diagram shows the various types of supplier backgrounds. So making a move on this market are business intelligence and analytics software firms, energy domain software firms, alongside energy purchasing and utility billing software firms. But another type of innovation in the market is energy data services, 
from startups like Urgenet, which help different types of vendors, including software firms, in acquiring energy costs and use data from multiple utilities for distributed facilities. And so, just to conclude my section of today's webinar, we believe that energy that better energy data will transform the way in which firms tackle energy challenges. And the audience of this data will extend beyond the energy manager. So, as the organizational chart shows, energy data aids with multiple strategic and tactical business objectives. For example, those in the sustainability roles are likely to be already using energy data to support with the reporting of progress against sustainability metrics. But more strategic energy management will require data analytics that can adequately support decision making at the corporate level. This requires functionality such as scenario planning, energy cost analytics, and statistical forecasting. Therefore, we believe better energy data is the foundation of more strategic energy management within corporations. Thank you, Susan. And now I'd like to hand it over to Bill Moyer with UPS. Very good, Eric. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present to you all today. Hopefully, I can add some additional insights to what Susan has laid out. This is just kind of a typical commercial slide for those of you that may not be as familiar with UPS's operations uh, before I get into the energy piece. UPS was founded in 1907. We were focused on the concept of common core carrier, um, selling delivery as a service to retail stores, which back then all tended to have their own delivery vans. Today, we service over 220 countries. We process more than 15 million packages a day. That amount will double to an excess of 30 million this year during peak season. We operate domestically in over 1,800 facilities. Uh, we put in excess of 93,000 delivery vehicles of varying types out on the road each day, fly in excess of 220 UPS jet aircraft, not including chartered planes. And you can generally view uh, our um, structure as three separate operational segments, package operations, UPS supply chain logistics, and UPS freight services. My energy responsibilities are relative to facility energy and use. We do have a procurement department that handles the supply side of energy, both stationary needs like regulated electricity and natural gas for facilities, and mobile uh, needs like fuel for vehicles and airplanes. The facility portion falls within the sustainability group, uh, which is part of the plant engineering function. We have been producing a sustainability report since about 2002, and we have refined that effort as our understanding of the process in the industry has changed. And we welcome you to check out our sustainability report. The website location address is down at the bottom. I'm going to follow on what Susan said by just kind of taking a little bit of a historical personal view from what things I've experienced in the past. To, uh, essentially, Susan mentioned that what we're talking about today are trends uh, and continuing trends of what could be referred to as the so-called information age and the digital revolution that has been really occurring for decades. If I were to take a 20-year slice of my career with UPS, I could point to a time when three separate realities were converging upon the platform. We had a continued construction of capacity. We had increases in UPS product offerings and services, which notably included the desire of customers to track the status of their packages in real time. And there was an explosion of new technologies and automation on the plant floor and networking techniques. Back in 1984, I would have designed a facility that could process 200,000 packages an hour with essentially 250 motors and some basic relays and motor starters and disconnect switches. You go forward 20 years, and based on all of those changes in the process, by 2004, we would have had to have installed 700 motors, in addition, laser scanning tunnels for multi-sided scanning of barcodes and actually taking pictures of the boxes. We had computers, databases, frequency drives, and high-speed internet. The influx 
of these process changes generated a huge amount of real-time complex data that was absolutely necessary for us to get our handles on a handle on if we wanted to have effective control of the process. Here's another good technology-driven process that is replete with big data scenarios. For the last 10 years or so, UPS has been deploying telematics, which is the increased use of sensors and technology directly within our delivery feet, uh, excuse me, fleet. Engine data, GPS, sensors on various parts of the truck, the electronic clipboard and map data, all brought together to provide near real-time visibility of what is going on within our critical process of package delivery. Today, we're in the midst of deploying a riot, which has been referred to as the world's largest operations research project, which will optimize in real time UPS driver routing. Okay. Back to facility energy. I'm using here a slide that really talks about carbon, but I'm using carbon as a proxy for energy. If you looked at a UPS package and you said how much energy needed to be used, consumed, to move that package, Essentially, 11% of it would be in the facilities. About 19, 20% would be in the brown package cars that you're all familiar with. And 70% would be the uh, transportation network, the tractor trailers, the airplanes, etc. So that gives you an idea of where facilities fall on the energy front within our usage. Um, if you add costs and labor costs, the facility portion it becomes even smaller. This just takes a look, gives you a sense, a proportional sense of what the UPS facility costs domestically uh, from the most recent year for both electric, natural gas, and water. The, the total dollar amount is roughly $180 million, uh, of which 80% uh, of it is in the electric, uh, about 12 in the natural gas, and a little less than 8 on the water. We do also look at and track the water. Uh, essentially, 14% of our facilities account for about 80% of our costs. So it's, it's kind of a, an 80-20 type conversation. Another way to look at it, just looking at those 12, uh, excuse me, those 1,800 facilities, um, if uh, you broke those out and looked at their yearly 12-month, uh, took a yearly 12-month view of their total cost, uh, we have a significant number of facilities which have monthly costs in less than ten uh, less than ten thousand dollars a month. Okay, two things you need to develop cost effective solutions, and both of these things are data dependent. The first is you need to have, in my view, a good understanding of your utility tariff. Uh, I really cannot stress this enough. If you do not understand how utilities charge you for their product, the differences between kilowatt demand, kilowatt hour energy, peak and base demand, seasonal time differences, then you really do need to spend some time learning it. Uh, it's not that tough, but it gives you a lot more insights into ways to manage your cost. I just don't think you can make good judgments on investments if you do not understand how you pay for it. And you also need a good understanding of your facility usage profile. Um, Basically, energy cost is very localized. This slide looks at the cost differences between varying UPS facilities. Uh, a solution that might work in MassPit uh, really might not work in a place like Louisville, Kentucky, because there is such a discrepancy in what that local cost of electricity is. So your solution does have to be uh, somewhat geared to the reality of what it is that you're paying out there. Understanding the load profile that you're working with. UPS facilities are designed by UPS engineers, so we really do have a good understanding of what's in them. This gives you an idea of the connected load in a typical UPS facility. Well over 50% of it is in the processing equipment of conveyors and motors. Um, 15 to 20% of it tends to be in the lighting. Uh, very limited HVAC content, uh, less than 15% of our square footage is reserved for office type operations. Um, and essentially, uh, about 100 of our major operating facilities will have demand loads that uh, exceed one megawatt. This looks at the same facility but considers its use time of day. This is typical interval data that you can get from the utility 
uh, or obviously if you put in your own metering. We rely on the utility metering when we can. Uh, this is a typical two-sort facility. This is 15-minute data over the course of one 24-hour period. You can see two scenarios where we process volume, one of them from about 4 in the morning until uh, 8, and the other from about 5 at night until about 10. This is very classic for a typical UPS facility. If we were to look at the same thing over a month, you can actually pick out the uh, individual days, the weekends. Um, we run very, very uh, solid patterns on our operational process, and it's important for you to understand those things when you're looking at and trying to evaluate solutions for your energy cost. Within UPS facilities, we've pretty much tried just about uh, everything. We've done fuel cells, lighting upgrades, best practices, and energy management systems, uh, turned down thermostats, um, you know, pretty much uh, would run the gamut in terms of trying to take a look at things that uh, would help us get our costs under control. Going back to 1994, just talking about the energy data piece. If we wanted to look at our energy data back then, and we actually did this, we would go ahead and we would call our, local, our corporate accounting department. At that time, we had 50 separate districts. Those 50 districts would be contacted by corporate, probably through a memo. They would be asked to grab the next month's invoice, make a copy of it, put it in a house mail envelope, send it up to corporate. Corporate would then sit down in my group, and we would basically enter that all into some sort of a spreadsheet program. Back then, it might have been Quattro Pro. And we would then go ahead and be able to look at this stuff and try to figure out what it was that we were paying for and what it was that we might want to do with rate changes, etc. My point's obvious. The process took weeks. In 2005, we went down the path of consolidated billing. This is the application today where we have consolidated billing and all of our utility data now flows through that consolidating uh, data billing location and it all gets entered into a large database. I'll be honest, I have a bit of a, a love-hate relationship with this system. Having spent time chasing individual invoices in 1994, I understand the value of having direct web access to a centralized database of invoice data. Unfortunately, it was built to pay invoices. It does not, at the end of the day, give good, solid, visible data at the energy level. It was, it was built to make sure that the bills were paid and the lights did not get turned off for failure to pay. Um, so there is a lot more additional data out there that, as an energy manager, I really need access to in order to make the decisions we're trying to make. Next slide, please. After having done that in 2005, we went down the path of having the regions, now that the data was available, reporting on their energy data in a this year, last year type of fashion. Uh, fashion. The BSC stands for the Balanced Scorecard, which was a localized reporting mechanism that came up through corporate. In this scenario, all we're really doing is we're choosing a baseline of last year and asking folks to take a look at how they did this year. The problem is, it really doesn't offer you much additional insight. What we were looking for is the, how much you should use in a given uh, month. And to that, we really needed to get closer to normalizing that data against something. Here's an example, the kind of the classic example for heating loads, heating energy. Uh, you can go ahead and you can uh, normalize that data to heating degree days, but when we were using the utility provided invoices and this centralized reporting system, we had some real problems with it. First of all, the, the invoices did not necessarily map directly to uh, month dates, yet the heating degree days did. So there's a fair amount of effort that had to be undertaken just to um, uh, you know, massage the data around both of those um, regressions or both of those models uh, are the same billing data. We've just allowed for better heating degree day calendarization to basically show that the uh, model improves drastically. So that was a big part of what we needed to get to. Really, 
we want them to do the same thing with the kilowatt hours. There was no reason that we could not, given the fact that our loads were so driven by the process of sorting packages, that we could not tie those packages as a normalizing variable to our kilowatt hour consumption. And so today, that is what we do. We have uh, every region and every district has a series of spreadsheets. They can pull their data directly off of um, the centralized reporting. We normalize our kilowatt hours to the volume processed in a district, the weather in that district in the form of heating degree days and cooling degree days. And so for any given month, we tell, we have a number that defines how much energy the district should have used. If you're below that, you're probably managing it well. If you're much above it, you're probably not. And I've, I've got two more slides I wanted to relay to you here, and that is how all this modeling and all of this data has helped us find things that we actually did not expect to find. Utilities obviously will make mistakes. Um, we were using normalized data on the natural gas modeling for a few years and a particular utility came to us and said they had a bad meter and that meter hadn't registered correctly and they've gone back and they've looked at uh, the last two and a half years and felt that we owed them close to $40,000. And they brought out their models to show what they were showing. Well, since we had our own modeling and our own normalized data, and we had gone through a big set point change about halfway through. We were able to show that after we sent out the memo changing set points locally, we had a reduction that had nothing to do with the bad meter, but in fact had to do with the process change. We were able to go back and argue out of about three quarters of that $40,000, and that's the value of having normalized data available. Last slide. And this is one that we recently found which really struck me. Uh, um, this is uh, interval data for a facility in Secaucus, New Jersey. I had originally gotten the data because I really wanted to take a look at, we had installed a large solar array on the roof and I wanted to start to look at uh, the performance uh, of that facility in net metering with that array. And they had installed a brand new meter, which the utility ha typically has to do uh, for net, proper net metering. And about six weeks after they installed it, uh, well, a couple months after, they sent me the whole uh, list of data. And when I was looking at their 15-minute interval data, I found this one individual spike that went up to 3,400 kW. You go look at the invoice, and we were charged for that 3,400 uh, kW spike. It was about a $35,000 additional charge. We have never in that facility gotten past 2,200 kW in the last five years. We basically went back to them and said, we have no idea what happened, but that don't look right. And they just rolled over and basically uh, credited us back about uh, three quarters of the money. Bottom line, those mistakes are out there. I was somewhat surprised to think that a meter could do that. I don't know what happened. They didn't explain it. Uh, but there is money out there um, that you would not normally expect to, to find. And so uh, some final thoughts. Uh, you need your data. You, does, you need to understand your cost structure and your tariff to really understand the process. You have to understand your own process, your usage and load profile, and for that you probably need to get your hands on interval data. And there's an enormous value in being able to normalize your data uh, to the things that drive your process so that you can start to understand when that process uh, is not performing the way it should. Because at the end of the day, you can't, the only energy that you can save is energy that you're wasting. That's it. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Susan. So I wanted to just provide a quick uh, summary slide before we get into some of the Q&A. Um, hopefully this provides a nice recap for the presentations that you've seen this afternoon. The first, obviously, is that energy management is data-centric. So as the role with, uh, of energy management within large organizations becomes much more strategic to the firms, um, relying on data becomes even more critical. I think we've seen that. Uh, we've also seen that just gathering this energy data can be problematic. So services like the one that Urgenet provides can help many organizations that are trying to get their arms around this. 
And then finally we learned that the energy data by itself is an incomplete solution that must be married with software that can do the types of analytics and uh, present the type of information that you saw from Bill to allow them to understand what's going on and make good decisions around how they manage energy. So those are the key takeaways. Um, while we've been going through this session today, um, a bunch of questions have been posted and we'll see if we can uh, get to several of these. The first one, Bill, is, is directed to you. And that is to support uh, a lot of the initiatives that you under, uh, have undertaken. How do you get executive support to fund and, and, um, and provide support to the things that you're embarking on? Well, uh, you know, I, I think that the whole conversation, the, the increasing conversation over the last 10 years or so on the sustainability front has certainly added some additional um, ballast to the conversation. Uh, it, it does facilitate uh, driving um, people at the at the upper ends of organizations to care more about these things. But I am still very much on the cost side of things. That I mean, at the end of the day, um, you really do need to be able to find those scenarios and put those scenarios in front of people that show where the costs are, what the costs are, um, and look for those situations where you can remove that cost and show the savings that folks in, at the upper level of the organization are going to be looking for. Okay, great. Thank you. And then, Susan, if you can hear us, I think this question is directed to you, and that is, what steps should firms take to implement a better data management strategy? Great. Um, well, yeah, that's certainly um, a good question. Um, so, I mean, I suppose the kind of key part of a, a good data management strategy, it's really founded on having um, complete data sets. So that would be um, data across all kind of domains within the organization. Um, it's also important to collect accurate data sets. Um, and what we have seen is um, collecting bigger data sets on things like energy and business operations. There's kind of more scope for errors to cascade across these bigger data sets. Um, so, yeah, just really any good data management strategy will be based on kind of accurate and complete data. Finally, um, kind of the next step would really be centralizing this data. And this means really ag aggregating and bringing together all these separate um, data management systems to produce um, a centralized data resource where you can start um, properly looking at trends um, in relation to energy across the organization. So certainly these three areas I have spoken through, the complete data, accurate data, and centralized data, I mean, they're certainly perhaps challenging for firms to implement. So um, we typically um, suggest that firms kind of break their entire organization down into building blocks. Um, and then, um, so that might be building a data management plan around your data center, around your commercial office buildings. And then the next step would be taking these different building blocks of um, data and then integrating them into a centralized system. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question here, perhaps this is one that's best directed at Urgenet. I'll try to answer it. The question is, uh, we want to start using interval data, but it's expensive to install meters at all the locations. Is there an alternative? Um, and yeah, as I talked about uh, the UrgeNet uh, Meter Connect product, we're able to uh, pull information back from the utility provided meters. This is AMI or, or, or interval data, um, but it doesn't require the installation of any type of meter at the facility. You can just leverage the smart meter that the utilities provided and we can bring back and, and deliver to our customers data from that meter. I hope that answers that question. Uh, let's see. Um, Bill, I think this is a good one for, yeah, this is definitely directed to UPS, and the question is, what programs have you implemented that have had the biggest impact on energy, positive impact on energy spend? Well, uh, you know, um, from, a from a programmatic perspective, um, we obviously, you're com we're coming at it from two perspectives, two, two sides. One, if we can remove the load from the system through things like lighting upgrades, technical solutions that do the job 
uh, we're going to do that if if it's if it's cost effective. I and mean, we have our first lighting upgrade program was done in 1993. In the last six years, we've probably done about 120,000 um, uh, fixture upgrades across the U.S. So clearly, anything that you can do to get the 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 actual uh, load out of the system is is a good move. Uh, we do struggle with energy management systems, to be honest, to getting paybacks on those just because of our profile. Um, putting the data in front of people, trying to engage them, and there's lots of ways to do it. We're doing it through the balanced scorecard. Part of what we're doing with that process is we're basically telling them the amount of energy at the district level they should be using. And when they get out of, uh, uh, you know, out of control, so to speak, being a controls engineer, it, gets, it gives them something to go look at and find. And we also allow them within that process to get credit uh, for uh, energy saving solutions. So we're trying to engage them through simple data and simple data constructs that they can basically use to understand how things are going. They do not have as much time to become subject matter experts as I do. So that's pretty much how we're trying to focus the balanced scorecard effort. Okay. Thank you for that. And then, Susan, a question here for you. What about issues of data quality with big data? Great. Um, yeah, that, that's a, um, certainly a good question. Um, so just, I mean, in terms of what, what we have found with um, our research is that small data errors um, can cascade into bigger data quality problems. So big data certainly runs into the same data quality issues as other data sets. But the impact can actually be much larger. Um, so in energy management, poor data quality really limits a firm's ability to leverage data for improved outcomes. And it may also actually drive um, erroneous decisions. Um, and what we have really found is um, if you can really identify um, kind of looking at utility bill data, it kind of opens up the possibilities of actually identifying inaccuracies in the kind of charges you're receiving from your studies. So I think that point was discussed a bit, a bit earlier. But yeah, no, certainly it's really, um, as we start, as organizations start producing these larger data sets, there's kind of a really important focus just to kind of ensure vigorous kind of data validation steps um, at all parts of the process. Okay. Great, thanks. The next question here is directed at Urgenet. That is, how many utilities do you connect to, and what if we have providers that aren't on your list? Um, I might have mentioned earlier in the presentation that we've done integrations with about 800 different utility billing systems. This includes utilities in North America and in Europe, and uh, we're adding new utilities every week. So um, our customers that that we're signing up or, or existing customers that want us to go in new places. It's just part of our standard process to be adding new providers to our platform all the time. Okay, um, Bill, another question that's directed at you, and that is someone indicating they work at, a, at an organization with a thousand different facilities, and they're just getting serious about energy management. How should they start? Well, I, I'm going to kind of go for that. I'm going to kind of go back to my final thoughts. I, you, I, I would start by uh, uh, getting your hands on as much of your billing data as you can, uh, preferably a year's worth. Um, I would start by making sure that you understood your cost structure, how it is that utilities uh, in general charge for the delivered product, uh, and specifically relative to your own um, situation uh, by looking at your cost structure and the tariff that you were on. Uh, talk to the utilities in those instances where there may be options. Uh, and, and understand your process, uh, usage and load profile, by looking at the interval data that you can get directly from the utility. Uh, and then the last piece, and that's the tougher one, it's the one that requires some analytical ability and some, some analytical understanding of things like normalized data and how you do regression and some of those other mathematical type things. Um, but those really are the steps that I think you need to go through if you want to get your arms around, uh, you know, energy and energy cost within your facilities. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, Susan, I think this question is probably best directed at you, and it is, 
who are the typical users of all this energy data? Great. Um, but yeah, that's certainly um, a good question. Um, so, I mean, what we have found is kind of the most typical user will be that person within the organization who is tasked with energy management. So, um, large organizations um, are likely to have a dedicated energy manager, although the actual kind of energy manager of some organizations may come under di um, diverse job titles. So it might be the facilities director, head of real estate, head of operations. They may be picking up the energy management responsibilities for their tasks. So we um, typically see the energy manager as the kind of typical um, audience of energy data. But just going back to one of the points I made um, earlier in the presentation, um, as energy becomes an increasingly strategic issue for firms, um, and this trend is already apparent within the energy intensive sector, um, we see the relevance of energy data rising up the organization. So thinking about firms operating in the energy intensive sector, um, I mean, we've seen examples of the CFO already becoming interested in um, energy usage and cost data. Um, and, and in those types of organizations, the, the CFO is starting to view um, energy as kind of a cost lever where they can um, improve profit margins and more general business performance. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Um, this is a question specifically about the UrgeNet data service, and that is the question of, uh, of are they able to get a bill image with the UrgeNet service? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, we can actually provide, along with our data delivery, either a copy of the bill image in the form of a PDF, or we'll deliver just a link to the bill image that we'll store up in the cloud. Our data service actually runs on top of Amazon Cloud, and so um, along with delivering our customers the data, we also store their bill images and they can, as I said, either receive a link to that bill image or they can receive the, uh, the bill image itself. That's at their preference. And then, Bill, another question came in for you, and I, I, you seem to do an awful lot, so I guess someone asked a logical question, that is, how big is your team? You got them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, ju just me. The sustainability group uh, has about four or five folks. Um, you know, and, and, and that's that really is a, 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 a it's a good point to make, and 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 it's one of the reasons why, um, you know, uh, you really do need the sophistication of of the data um, capabilities that are out there today. Obviously, when you go back to 1994. It was a different world. I was run, I was in charge of the electrical group, and we had about 15 people back then. Energy has since uh, been split off as a separate group within sustainability, and that is my role. Um, so it, you know, it does kind of support the, the belief or the philosophy that um, Susan has mentioned that, that this is becoming more important. Um, but yeah, I, I need the software to help me find and do the things because it's it, on my end. It's it's just me. Okay, well, you're definitely doing a lot, so I'm not sure that's appreciated. Let's see, another question here. This is directed at UrgeNet. I have different users who want energy data, and all use different applications. Can UrgeNet connect to them? So, as I mentioned earlier, we've got standard connectors into industry applications, so depending on what applications you're using, we may have a connector that can snap right in and deliver the data directly into those applications. But if not, we um, have uh, the ability to develop a custom adapter for you. So, yeah, the, the data feed that we provide is really envisioned as one that can be used throughout the enterprise. So whether the data is meant to get into accounting or into energy management or sustainability or, re or, or um, real estate, um, that's the whole idea of our, of our data feed is that we can deliver it to you and it can be consumed in whatever back-end applications um, that you want. And then maybe time for one more question, Susan. I think you might be the best for this. Actually, it is directed at you. What types of analytics are firms applying to this energy data? Um, okay, that's a good question. Um, just to give some context, um, I mean, for the past kind of two years, I really have been tracking kind of big energy data software applications. Um, and just kind of the kind of core functionality of this class of software, I mean, it really seems to be about um, data aggregation. So that's processing data from different energy systems and devices um, and trying to translate it in, into a common data type. Um, we're also seeing functionalities um, around
and energy data visualization, um, energy data performance analytics, um, energy data forecasting, um, and energy data cost analytics. Um, and it really seems to be um, just enabling firms to get a better insight um, into their kind of future energy spend and future energy usage. And it's really just to support this kind of budget planning. So yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing um, various kind of analytics emerging. Um, and it really seems to be um, kind of the general trend is about applying more advanced business intelligence analytics to um, energy data sets. And this is really becoming a lot more sophisticated than um, kind of the more general energy management software tools that, that date back to the early 1990s. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Well, um it's been a very, uh, the audience has been very engaged in the, in, in the presentation today. We've got a bunch of questions, unfortunately, that we weren't able to get to, but what we will do is um, summarize in the form of a written document all the questions we weren't able to get to. We'll post the answers to those and deliver those back out to the group. So we will, in one way, get all your questions answered here. Um, again, thank you for joining us here today. Um, in addition to providing the uh, answers to questions we weren't able to get to, we will also provide a recording of this and, and give access to each of you to a recording of the webinar here this afternoon. And I would just invite you, if you have further questions, to feel free to contact us. My email address is here as well as my phone number, and um, we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>